thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Great. Well, that was just phenomenal. Thank you so much, um, Hinal. Um, and um, so folks, we will um, have some conversation um, at the end of the day today for folks who might be interested in doing some more work like the Just Fair in your own state, like Hinal is doing in, um, in Virginia. So as a little tickler um, for, for later on today. Um, so next up, we'll have um, uh, Molly Coleman. Molly is a graduate of Harvard Law School, where she worked for a number of legal organizations committed to advancing justice for the most marginalized, including Gender Justice, Legal Voice, the Mental Health Legal Advisors Committee, the Hennepin County Public Defender's Office, and the Fair Labor Division of the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office. She's also served as the Editor-in-Chief of the Harvard Civil Rights uh, uh, Civil Rights, Civil Liberties Law Review. Prior to law school, Molly, Molly spent three years with the city year New York, working to close the opportunity gap for students in Harlem and the Bronx and to empower young people to become civically engaged leaders. She's a graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a native of St. Paul, Minnesota. So uh, all of you McAllister folks, Molly is one of us. Um, and I will now turn it over to you. Welcome, Molly. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody for having me. I am excited to be here. I'm super excited about everything that this group is doing. Um, it's really cool. And all of your breakfasts sound really delicious, especially the pumpkin pancakes. Um, I'm also going to share my screen. Let's see if I can pull this off. So uh, I'm going to talk today. I was just super interested in, in our last talk and thinking about why is all of this information so inaccessible, right? Why is it so hard to actually like scrape the data? Why is it so hard to figure out what's happening in our courts? Um, and that really dovetails nicely with what I wanted to talk about, which is how did we get to this place where what is happening in our legal system is so terrible most of the time? Um, and why is it that we aren't able to see what's actually happening? Why is it that who has sort of a vested interest in keeping the public um, from engaging deeply with what's happening in courtrooms. Why is it that we have so little control over our third branch of government? Um, so I'm gonna fly through this. Um, as you know, it has been in the news a lot lately, the Supreme Court isn't working. Um, I think that in the last couple of months as the Supreme Court has acted or not acted on abortion related cases. Um, it's been kind of front and center in the national conversation, but as I'm sure you all know, none of that is new, right? The court using its power to harm vulnerable people is something that's been going on for, for a very long time. Um, just this year, you know, we've had a number of cases that have, that have worked to benefit the powerful and work to actively harm um, be already disenfranchised, marginalized, et cetera. The question is why, right? How'd we get here? What the heck is happening? Sorry. Um, so a couple of sort of entities, organizations who I think that some of whom, you know, we think about when it comes to bringing the courts, others of whom really have not, um, gotten the credit that they deserve for rigging the courts um, and i.e. have not been held accountable for rigging the courts. So the biggest one that I think often gets ignored is the ways in which corporate America has decided that the civil legal system should serve them and nobody else. Um, this was a very intentional strategy, right? In 1971, a future Supreme Court justice, Lewis Powell, wrote a memo to the Chamber of Commerce basically saying we need to prioritize the courts. We need to care about what's happening in, in courtrooms around the country. And this is going to be the best way to create the social political change that we want to see over the next you know, 50 years. And they did it. Um, they have been able to install pro-corporate judges on all levels, you know, state courts, lower courts, Supreme Courts, the US Supreme Court. Um, they've been able to, uh, you know, get the best and the brightest lawyers in the country to think that doing pro-corporate work is morally and ethically um, neutral, morally and politically neutral, and 
and they've normalized this, right? They've kind of made us think that this is the way it has to be. Courts have to serve corporate interests and that's just what the law is. It's not what the law is, right? The law is created, it's interpreted by real people um, who have their own biases, their own, their own tendencies to side with XYZ groups. Um, and it's, it's done immense harm. And we'll talk about that a bit. The Federal Society Second Organization, I think that this is probably an org that more folks think about when they think about the courts, um, especially with some of the excellent reporting that's come out over the last couple of years, um, especially during the Trump administration about the role that they play. You know, for those who aren't familiar, the Federalist Society started in the 80s by a group of disaffected conservative law students who felt that they were being marginalized on campuses. They were at, you know, the best law schools in the world. They were very white and privileged and all that, but they were marginalized. And so they needed to start this group so that they could find community. And they did that and then they took over the legal system. And now we are all living in the world that the Federalist Society built. So six, the, all six of the conservative Supreme Court justices at the federal level um, have Federalist Society ties or Federalist Society members. Um, you know, they claim to just be a debating society, but really it's a far right organization that uses their power to hand select judges, to hold judges accountable, to using their positions to you know, advance conservative causes. Um, you know, and, it, and it's not just the courts, right? Like they're also federal society members are at the highest levels of government during every Republican administration of the last 40 years. Um, but when it comes to the courts, it's the takeover has been unprecedented. And then finally, as I was saying earlier, kind of with the ways that the corporate corporate forces have shaped our legal system, a huge way they've done this is to make us all think that it's okay, right? That doing pro-corporate work that actually harms workers and consumers and everybody in this country, that that's, that's totally fine. That's just all in a day's work. You can still be somebody who believes in justice. It's just not what you do during your day job. Um, and a huge way in which corporate America has been able to do this is through influencing legal elites um, who prioritize you know, camaraderie with one another over what actually happens to real people when people are in positions of power and want to use that power for not social justice causes. Um, so, you know, just a few examples here of folks being like, well, I'm a liberal, but, you know, I think that it's, we should definitely get Brett Kavanaugh or Amy Coney Barrett or Neil Gorsuch on the Supreme Court. Um, it's just, we have different approaches. Well, one approach harms people and one doesn't. Um, I think you probably all know how I feel about that. I don't think I'm hiding at all. Um, super quickly, I know I only have a minute. I don't know why this is so messed up. Um, you know, just a few quick examples of kind of what this looks like in practice. I think that the most important thing to know is that our judiciary is completely inaccessible for most people. So I know that you all are doing a lot of work in the criminal legal space. And for most folks, the only way that they'll ever get into a courtroom is if they're accused of a crime. Um, and frankly, you know, with plea bargaining and whatnot, even then they may not appear in front of, you know, actually receive the trial that they're entitled to. But when it comes to using the courts to hold the powerful accountable, um, especially in civil litigation, it's, it's, it's just not happening. The court doors have been shut for people um, across the country. There are a number of ways in which this has happened, including through the development of forced arbitration um, as a concept, which now basically says that it was funny when Hanal was talking about um, terms and conditions. It's like, right, nobody reads those. It's annoying to have to click through them, but everybody just accepts them. Well, hidden in those terms and conditions is the fact that you can't take anybody to court anymore. You've signed away your right to go to court if you're harmed. Um, the courts work for the wealthy and powerful. And when everybody else wants to use them to try to seek justice, they don't have the opportunity to. Class action waivers, corporate immunity, sort of all these legal doctrines that have been created by lawyers in order to say, mm, nope, nobody else gets to go to court. Sorry, this branch of government is shut off to everybody else. Um, and then the fact that, you know, as I know many folks here are very well aware, if you do make it inside of a courtroom, your odds of finding justice are just incredibly low. Um, it's a branch of government that has been fully taken over by corporate partners, by former prosecutors, and the outcomes of their decisions really reflect that. We see that in, you know, in, so there's actually this excellent report, I'd recommend everybody check it out, by uh, Joanna Shepard, she's a law professor at Emory, who's really studied the relationship between professional diversity and outcomes on the bench. 
and how we see it you know, this isn't just like, in theory, it's a problematic that there are all these corporate lawyers on the bench. In theory, it's a problem that there are all these former prosecutors on the bench. No, in reality, that is having harmful outcomes for real people every single day. Um, and then I think it's just important to note that there's really been no effort to unrig the civil legal system. And I think a huge part of that is because all of these powerful entities have a vested interest in making sure we don't know what's happening, that we're not thinking about it, that the average person, you know, you might want to, you know, that you have to vote, you want to get out and make sure that you're engaging in electoral politics, but the courts aren't something that we should be thinking about because, you know, we don't, at the federal level, we don't vote. Um, at the state level, if you're voting on judges and you're like me, you're basically completely uninformed and like checking off like, okay, incumbents seem good. I don't know. I don't know about this. Nobody's campaigning. I'm not getting the information I need to like really understand how folks are sentencing from the bench, how they're supporting or harming workers and consumers on the bench. Um, and that's incredibly problematic, right? Because a lot of people are paying attention. A lot of really powerful people are paying attention and they're using the fact that we don't know what's happening um, to allow them to get away with it. So I will leave it there, um, but super grateful to have had the opportunity to be with you all um, and just really, really excited about what you're all doing.